Book 5 Chapter 48 Cops Who Came In From The Cold On August 30th, 1979, the day after being sentenced to serve three consecutive life sentences in prison, MacDonald began a four-year correspondence with Joe McGinnis. It culminated in the book Fatal Vision, published on September 16, 1983. The adapted miniseries, which was broadcast on November 18 and 19, 1984. In a civil suit, MacDonald filed against McGinnis for fraud on August 31, 1984. And ultimately, in a second civil suit filed by Freddie and Mildred Kassab against MacDonald to recover any of the money that had been paid to MacDonald by McGinnis. This correspondence is famous, or infamous, depending on how you look at it. It ended up serving as the centerpiece of a two-part article by Janet Malcolm that appeared in The New Yorker in 1989 and was later published in a book of the same title, The Journalist and the Murderer. It was used by her as proof of the depravity of all journalism. Malcolm wrote, Every journalist who is not too stupid or too full of himself to notice what is going on knows that what he does is morally indefensible. Malcolm writes that the early letters between the two men, like the overture to an opera, announce all the themes of the coming correspondence. McGinnis wrote letters assuring MacDonald of his friendship, commiserating with him about his situation, offering him advice about his appeal, requesting information for the book, and fretting about competing writers. The passages dealing with the last concern, a very common one among writers, every writer thinks someone else is working on his subject. It is part of the paranoid state of mind necessary for the completion of the infinitely postponable task of writing, make especially painful reading. The letters, excerpts of which are provided below, provide a mystery of their own. Assuming that McGinnis believed that MacDonald was innocent when he first became involved, at what point did he come to believe MacDonald was guilty? Was it during the trial? Was it after MacDonald was freed in August 1980 following his successful appeal to the Fourth Circuit? Or was it after MacDonald was returned to prison on March 31, 1982, when the Supreme Court reversed that decision? And what provoked his change of heart? A new appraisal of the evidence? Or the exigencies of delivering a manuscript? MacDonald's First Letter to McGinnis Following His Conviction Zero hour plus eighteen. I've got to write to you so I won't go crazy. I'm standing in my cell only because they don't allow chairs in solitary. I'm trying to fathom, trying to figure out what the fuck happened. Those words from the foreman, Mr. Hardison's mouth, crashed into my brain, and I can't think straight. I heard not guilty to first degree, and instantly felt, finally, justice and maybe some peace down the road. In the next instant, he said guilty of second-degree murder. The room was spinning, and I couldn't hear the rest. I remember the tears on many jurors' faces, and I remember the look of, please forgive me on the face of the black juror and the lady who cried so much. But I really can't remember the jury polling except how forceful the guy with the pinched face in the front row, three in from the left, I think, said guilty three times. He really believed it. I can't understand how it happened. Twelve normal people heard a good portion of the evidence, not all, of course, and bought the government line of bullshit. Was it just because the government said so? Were our jury selection people wrong? I guess so. They were so right-wing middle class they couldn't believe the government would falsify evidence, or fake it, or redo it, or build an imaginary web of circumstances based on vicious Mildred Kassab now remembering something was going wrong in that house. I want to see Bernie, McDonald's attorney, because I love him, and he is probably hurting beyond belief, and I want to know he is not to blame. I want to see my mom because, no matter how I look, by seeing me she will be better, and I probably will be too. I would also love to see my best friends like Dudley and Steve, and now I hope you. But in all honesty, I'm crying too much today, and do cry whenever I think of my close friends. I feel dirty and soiled by the decision and can't tell you why, and am ashamed. 
I somehow don't feel that way with Bernie and Mom, but think today it would be difficult to look at you or shake your hand. I know I'll cry and want to hug you, and yet the verdict stands there, screaming, You are guilty of the murder of your family. And I don't know what to say to you, except it is not true. And I hope you know that, and feel it, and that you are my friend. In McGinnis's first letter to MacDonald in prison, McGinnis is McDonald's somewhat unctuous champion. Total strangers can recognize within five minutes that you did not receive a fair trial. September 11, 1979 Every morning for a week now, I've been waking up wondering where you are. A bus. Christ. It seems that the only function a ride across country in a prison bus might serve is to make your final destination seem not quite as awful as it otherwise would have. On the other hand, I'm sure your destination seems awful, is awful. Terminal Island. Pretty terrible name, on top of everything else. Did not see any point in writing back until now because I suspected they did not deliver mail to the bus. I'm awfully glad you have written so much, though. Both for personal and professional reasons— and it's getting pretty hard to tell the two apart. I am glad to see that you are able to write, to describe and analyze both what happened to you and your own feelings about it. I have plenty of my own thoughts, which I'll be getting to sooner or later, but honestly, I am relieved to see that you are apparently able to function constructively despite the extreme limitations. Also, I'm glad you didn't kill yourself, because that sure would have been a bummer for the book. There could not be a worse nightmare than the one you are living through now, but it is only a phase. Total strangers can recognize within five minutes that you did not receive a fair trial. It's a hell of a thing. Spend the summer making a new friend, and then the bastards come along and lock him up. But not for long, Jeffrey. Not for long. More soon. Joe. In his next letter to MacDonald, McGinnis reiterates his belief in McDonald's innocence, criticizing the jury and suggesting that their book will vindicate McDonald in the end. September 28, 1979 What the fuck were those people thinking of? How could twelve people not only agree to believe such a horrendous proposition, but agree with the man's life at stake, that they believed it beyond a reasonable doubt, in six and a half hours? It's a damned good thing I'm writing a book, otherwise I don't know how I would cope with all these reactions. Many of the letters that follow reiterate McGinnis's belief in McDonald's innocence. But there is something new. There is talk that Freddy Kassab will write a book. If McGinnis's book is the pro-McDonald book, Kassab's book will be the anti-McDonald book. And indeed, as it turns out, there are multiple books in the works what to do with his own book. McGinnis could write a piece of advocacy and defend MacDonald against the depredations of the justice system, or accept the results of the trial and tell the story of the killer who nearly got away. Two possible approaches, investigation into an open case or the history of a closed one. He shouldn't be in jail versus why he's in jail. A long letter from December 18, 1979, I call it the Boyd Norton letter because of the reference to the scientist friend of McGinnis's. A laundry list of points, from the threat posed by a possible Freddy Kassab book to the nature of the pajama top demonstration. But what is going on here? Is McGinnis showing MacDonald that he still believes in his innocence, that he is truly appalled by the junk science presented in the courtroom? Or has he descended into a world of calculation and manipulation? There are two points. The government's case is bogus, and I need your help in preventing other books from appearing before ours. December 18, 1979 Freddy Kassab has made it official. The New York Times Book Division, called New York Times Books, has given him a contract for a book about you and the murders and how he eventually brought you to trial. I wonder whether, from your end, it might not be a good idea to have Bernie send some sort of letter to New York Times Books and or to the writer, reminding them of the extent to which libel and invasion of privacy laws might apply in this situation. 
Boyd Norton, wilderness photographer and former nuclear physicist, was staying with us last week. Boyd points out that if one's wrists are entangled in a garment and one is being attacked, the only natural defensive motion would be not lateral, but directly towards the attacker. In other words, your forearms would be vertical, not horizontal, and you would be pushing toward the ice pick, thus causing contact to be perpendicular and permitting the holes to be cylindrical, as they were, rather than elongated tears. At the very least, Boyd is astonished that the defense did not perform such a demonstration to counter the government's, but even more astonished that such hocus-pocus could be admitted as evidence in court. In general, Norton makes the point that most criminologists are phony scientists, cops who got tired of standing in the rain, or cops who came in from the cold. Why would a person with any genuine scientific gift work in police or army labs at those wages, doing that drudge work, when there are so many options available? Boyd himself says that he would fly to San Francisco and go over all that is available, not the actual pajama top, etc., but all reports on procedures and conclusions, and he would do it simply for expenses, no fee involved, because he thinks you got screwed by lousy, lazy pseudoscience, and, as a true scientist, he is angered and offended by that. McGinnis concludes with a reference to Gunderson's investigations. Of course, by now maybe Gunderson has signed confessions and all of this, namely the consideration of physical evidence, is academic, but somehow I doubt it, and possibly with the brief already written, it is too late. And then in a letter to MacDonald, dated January 10, 1980, McGinnis asked for more help. The Take the Lid Off Letter It is your life, your book in that sense at least, and I need you to take the lid off and climb down in there and accomplish the distasteful task of telling me about your life in minute detail and with as honest an attempt to communicate the emotional content as you can manage. We just can't keep putting it off. Chapter 49 Just Be Jeff Somewhere around the start of 1980, a tape recorder had been smuggled into Jeffrey McDonald's prison cell. In response to McGinnis's goading, McDonald started speaking into it. It recorded an excursion into his own interior. Days and days worth of recollections and thoughts. By January 5th, McDonald began to speak into the recorder. I have sent four tapes so far. The first two stink. The second two start to get more info out and I now feel I'll eventually get you good tapes. I hope to tape at least a tape every other day, more if you need it, but it is difficult. The process itself is difficult. The memories are either vague or stark or uncomfortable, although it does occasionally seem to be cathartic. I felt silly at first, and still really haven't told you inside feelings in the tapes, but realize you saw the raw wounds, so I have to suck it up and plow ahead and get some info to you. The first tapes are, if anything, unexceptional. Nothing jumps off the page and says, I am a killer. An account of a routine childhood, acceptance at Princeton, marriage to Colette, birth of Kimberly, car trip to Chicago, and medical school at Northwestern. There are hundreds upon hundreds of pages of transcript. But if the goal is to ferret out evidence of psychopathology, one would be disappointed. The themes include dreaming of a farm near the water, working around the clock at medical school, his father's death, and a what-if. What if he had been sent to Vietnam right away, before February 17th? Tape 3 I was in Princeton and having a great time, and got married to Colette, and we had Kim, and we were just living, we thought, a gravy life. But we watched the chaos beginning around us with a little bit of alarm. I was reasonably right-wing, not from the viewpoint of racial intolerance or anything like that, but I sort of believed what the president said and felt that if there was an undeclared war, it was only because of some left-wing liberals in Congress that didn't have the sense to see what my father had seen and what other fathers saw and what all of us could see, that Vietnam needed defense and we were the ones who should be helping to defend it. There was a lot of turmoil, and it seemed like, you know, death and destruction around us. I might add that Colette and I never felt to be part of it, really. We were deeply in love, and were having a good time, you know, tripping through life. 
When I say tripping, I mean having a blast as far as life was concerned. Working very hard, but not really complaining. Both of us thinking that down the road there are rewards. We envisioned and planned a good life together. The ultimate goal was a farm near the water. A great combination. Tape 3 The freshman year of medical school, from 19... From September of 1964 until June of 1965 was a tough year. There's really no other way to describe it. In my usual optimistic fashion, I look back on it as a good year. But I think if pressed on details, it was a tough year. Scholastically, it was very hard. I had worked hard in Princeton, so I was prepared. I was not as ill-prepared as some of the other students coming in. But by the same token, I wasn't quite as ready as some of the other students coming in some of whom had only two years of college. They were in special six-year programs from Northwestern, and some of the students thought nothing of studying around the clock. I started out studying extremely hard and learned that if I wanted to do as well in medical school, or better in medical school, than I did in college, I had to work even harder. And by the end of the year, I was also working around the clock almost nonstop. It was definitely a year of trials. Tape 4 I am getting down near the end of this tape, and I wanted to talk about two things. One was my father's death. I was a medical student, and I myself recognized how sick he was when I was home just a few weeks earlier, and had been stealing myself for it. And Colette and I had talked at length about it. I remember sort of the world fell away. Couldn't believe that my father actually could die. And tears started coming down my face, and I went into the bedroom and sat down on the bed for a while and Colette came in and tried to comfort me. It wasn't easy to do. I didn't give up those feelings very gracefully or easily. But we got things together, threw a suitcase together that afternoon. I called the school and told them what happened, and we flew out, flew to New York right away. Tape 7 I met her in the 8th grade. We were in junior high school on South Ocean Avenue in Patchogue. And I can still remember when I first met her. She was walking down the hallway with her best friend, June Besser. They were kind of inseparable. They had gone to Bay Avenue Elementary School together and were very inseparable all through elementary school and junior high school. I can still remember them. It was on the fifth floor, the highest floor of the Patchogue Junior High School, which I think was the fifth floor, and my homeroom was up there, and they had walked past my homeroom. And I remember seeing Colette and June, and Colette had turned around and looked at me, and I looked back, and they just kept going. And I remember then, for about a week, I kept trying to find out who was the good-looking blonde who was always with the other blonde. Some people told me they were sisters, and some people told me they weren't sisters. But they had their reputation of being kind of aloof. I met her later, like it was two or three weeks after I'd initially seen her in the hall, and tried to figure out who she was. I can still remember as they walked past my homeroom. I was standing in the doorway, and she had this sort of... Very lovely appearance, quiet beauty, and a sort of vulnerable look. I met her later on again, like two weeks later in passing, and eventually I found out what her full name was and where her homeroom was, and we met on and off in the hallways, and I believe in one class. I finally had her in either a history or an English class, and we started talking, and eventually I found out where she lived, and I drove my bicycle over to her house one day, and we met that way. Those were seemingly, in retrospect now, painful times. Driving past her house on a bicycle until she noticed you, and then she'd call you over, and you'd go over and stand outside and talk in kind of a confused fashion, not trying to be forward or aggressive, but trying to talk to her and get to meet her and know her better. Tape 11 I was staying with my mom at the time. We went back out to the island to her apartment. That was a very painful time. I wasn't talking about what had happened at Fort Bragg, and yet that was my only thought. It was totally obsessive, and little bits and pieces, and Kimmy's face would come into view, and Christy running across the lawn would come into view, and Colette's incredible loving face, and little bits and pieces. The song that we always fell in love over each time was The Summer Place, from the movie with, incredibly enough, Troy Donahue. It was either in the last part of 8th grade or the first part of ninth grade that we went to the Rialto Theater and sat in the balcony and held hands and watched the movie. And I think we sat through it twice because we were so stunned by its beauty. 
and it was sort of always our movie. Although it was an outrageously bad movie, I think. It was a beautiful thing to us in the ninth grade at that time, and we fell in love to that song. And that was always our song. And whenever we heard it, it was, you know, it was a tremendous reminiscence. I still to this day, when I hear that song, get this big flood of sadness and nostalgia. And Colette, and warm eyes, and her blonde hair, and her warmth, and me holding her in the theater as a ninth grader, and us making love for the first time, and me going up to Skidmore and seeing her on Happy Pappy Weekend, and her coming down to Princeton and being a little frightened by it all. Tape 13. God damn, Joe, it's hard to talk to a stupid machine. There's no feedback, you know, there's no sense of the other person. There's no questions that take you off on a tangent. There's no interest. It's really hard to sit here and try to relate your love for a woman to a stupid box. And now I'm on tape 13. That's a lousy 13 hours. And I think that I could have told you all that I've told you on these 13 hours in a couple of hours. Maybe not, but it would have been a hell of a lot more interesting and more anecdotal had we been together. But not in the visiting room at Terminal Island. That's the problem. Tape 16. But I remember when I got the discharge papers and went over to have my last physical, like on December 3rd or December 4th, or the morning of the 15th, and finally got those papers in my hand, I thought to myself, why would I stay here one more night? There's no reason to stay one more night. And I left. And I drove up north. I felt almost a feeling, not of exuberance, but there was a real relief to get off Fort Bragg. I had strange thoughts as I drove away from Fort Bragg. Like, if the Army had sent me to Vietnam when I first got to the Green Beret status, after my first couple of training trips and when I came back from Puerto Rico and had my true Green Beret on, if they had sent me, that would have meant that Colette and the kids would have moved off post and back up north, probably to the house next to my mom, and therefore they would be alive, and I would have been unwounded, and I would be in Vietnam or... I would have come back home after a year with this year of experience under my belt and would have felt, you know, good about myself for having done that. So that was going through my mind. Tape 18. Nothing could happen, by the way, Joe, you know, for months and months and months. As a matter of fact, probably up to a year and a half later, nothing happened ever that did not somehow tie back to Colette, Kimberly, and Christy. There's just nothing that happened. You couldn't hear the music on the radio. You couldn't hear a song. If it was an old song, it's because I heard it with them. If it was a new song, it's because they would have loved to have heard it. If it was a bad movie, Colette and I could have laughed over how bad it was, and we could have remembered back to the one movie we walked out of, and that was Terrace Bulba with Yul Brenner. I find it hard not to like McDonald in these accounts. Who among us has not enjoyed talking about movies we hate with someone we love? More from Tape 18. A lot of recriminations, self-recriminations about not having told Colette I loved her enough. Colette would have flourished and flowered even more than she did with, I think, a little more obvious love for me. She had plenty of love from me, but she didn't get a lot of verbal reassurances. I wasn't capable of it then. I'm not making excuses, I'm just saying I didn't give it. But what does all of this tell us about Jeffrey MacDonald? When reading great blocks of material, here a binder of more than 600 pages, one has a tendency to skim, to look for the juicy parts, the parts that suggest conflict, even an intimation of violence. But they're just not there. If McGinnis was looking to find a monster lurking in the wings he'd be keenly disappointed. Chapter 50 I Can't Talk About What I Think A month after McGinnis asked McDonald to take the lid off, he wrote to Freddy Kassab, This letter, which was never part of Malcolm's book, is for me at the dark center of this story. McGinnis wants to assure Kassab that they share common goals. Rough translation, there is no reason for Kassab to be involved in a separate book. Their interests are no longer incompatible. Their interests might be the same. February 15, 1980 
Dear Mr. and Mrs. Kassab, We have not met, but I believe you may have been aware of my presence. I feel a deep and growing need to talk to you about the case, and would like to persuade you that seeing me would not be, for you and from your point of view, the distasteful experience it might seem. McGinnis goes on to outline the two conditions that he had given to MacDonald, but in essence he is providing a series of reassurances for Kassab. One was, for the duration of the trial and beyond, I would want guaranteed and total access to him, his lawyers, his files, his family, his friends, etc. I would, in other words, insist on being able to live with him throughout the trial. My second major condition was that there be an agreement in writing whereby it was acknowledged that I was totally independent and free to write whatever sort of book I saw fit to, even if, and this would have to be specifically spelled out, the eventual conclusions I reached in regard to the case were not those which Jeffrey MacDonald would have wished me to reach. In other words, and the agreement was very precise in this regard, even if the jury were to find him innocent, and I were then to write a book suggesting or stating he was guilty, he would be unable to do anything about it. I have been told, Mr. Kassab, that you have said you will not speak to me because you will do nothing that would help to put one more dime in the pocket of the man who murdered your wife's daughter, your stepdaughter, and your grandchildren. I would not attempt to persuade you that there is anything unreasonable about that position. It is impossible for me to project myself into your place, but I do sense that my own feelings in that regard might be extremely similar to yours. McGinnis writes he is aware of Kassab's own plans for a book on the case. He tells Kassab that he has access to transcripts and thousands of pages of other materials ranging from personal letters to diaries to things that I probably should not even mention because my awareness of their very existence may be privileged information. And then McGinnis compares himself to Kassab. He, too, has visited 544 Castle Drive. He, too, has a little girl called Christine, who is the age Kristen would be now. I have been at 544 Castle Drive, and the horror of what occurred there will remain with me in some capacity as long as I live. I have two daughters of my own, as well as two sons. My older daughter, whose name is Christine, is the age Kristen would be now. I am trying to say that this is no longer just a piece of work I have to do. It has already affected me more deeply than anything else I have ever been involved in, including Vietnam, and I feel a passionate commitment to myself to write the best, fullest, fairest, most accurate and truthful book possible. In that regard, as I say, two main points. One, I am uncomfortable having the major architect of the portrait of Colette be the man who has been convicted of murdering her. In writing a book in which her death is the central fact, I want the portrait of her in life to be drawn from those whose love for her and knowledge of her can never be called into question. Yourselves. Secondly, I am well aware of the significance of the role you played, Mr. Kassab, in bringing about the prosecution and eventual conviction. Clearly, you are a central figure in the book, in any book about this matter. Again, I'm uncomfortable having my major source of information about you and Mrs. Kassab be Jeffrey MacDonald. And I would deeply regret having to minimize your contribution simply because I was unable to gain sufficient information and detail about it. I would like you to understand here that I am not attempting in any way to double-cross or betray Jeffrey MacDonald. I have told him from the beginning that it would be my intention someday to try to talk to you. I am, at present, drafting a movie treatment for the eventual screenplay for the film that will be made from the book I write. I am not attempting in any way to double-cross or betray Jeffrey MacDonald. It's the kind of sentence written by someone who intends to do just that. It is the beginning of the end. MacDonald, having won an appeal on speedy trial issues, is living in California and working as an emergency room surgeon. McGinnis is already beginning to publicize his book on the case. And in October 1980, eight months after McGinnis's letter to the Kassabs, MacDonald, for the first time, 
tentatively expresses some concern that McGinnis might not believe in his innocence. October 14, 1980 Sherry took me to our favorite restaurant, The Mandarin, for Sunday dinner and gave me a handsome watch. She's tired of my black runner's watch day and night. I tried to explain it's not important, but you know. Anyway, we had a great time and had too much champagne. We even toasted you. Then I read the Sunday paper while she slept and noted the interview of you. Needless to say, in my usual unexpected brand of naivete, I hadn't expected comments like that from you and don't really know what to make of them. It's a little confusing because I had just finished a strange conversation with Bernie in which he was telling me how he sort of confronted you with some sort of request as to how you view my guilt or innocence. I poo-pooed it and him, thinking he was exaggerating his statements and your lack of response. Reading your quotes gave his version of your meeting a new weight and sobered me significantly. Sherry, interestingly enough, tells me to go with my original and recent gut feeling about you as a human being and or friend, hopefully both, and to ignore quotes in papers, etc., she feels the real story will be told effectively by you, and truth will out... Doubts. But MacDonald continues to make tapes. P.S. I've half-finished a tape to you. Hopefully we'll finish it shortly and get it and some letters to you and anything I can find from Colette. I'm avoiding that, in case you haven't caught on. I looked for the Telltale newspaper article and finally found it. It is from the San Francisco Examiner and Chronicle, October 12th, 1980. It is mostly about McGinnis's Alaska book, Going to Extremes, but contains a cryptic paragraph about MacDonald. Was MacDonald guilty? I can't always talk about what I think, McGinnis says. At the end of the book, the reader can draw a reasonable conclusion. I spent a great deal of time with both sides and got full cooperation. But this is so sad and horrible and I'll be so glad when it's over. It has affected my dream life, and not for the better. I didn't realize I would become so emotionally involved. About a year later, on October 28, 1981, another article appeared in a paper, this time in The Hollywood Reporter. Dan Wigato, a producer who had bought the rights to McGinnis's forthcoming book, was quoted, Dr. Jeffrey MacDonald, convicted of having murdered his wife and children. Days later, MacDonald found out about the Hollywood Reporter article and complained in a phone conversation to McGinnis. McGinnis had already written to MacDonald, discussing sundry sums of money, urging him to sign a release for Wigato, giving permission to turn the book into a movie, and informing him that Robert Mulligan, the director of To Kill a Mockingbird and The Summer of 42, was interested in directing. Days later, McGinnis was writing his editor about the whole episode. On November 3, 1981, McGinnis wrote to his editor, Morgan Entrican, at Delacorte. MacDonald was astounded that Taylor Wigato, the production company, could have given a story to the Hollywood Reporter to the effect that they were planning a film on Dr. Jeffrey MacDonald, convicted of having murdered his wife and children, when the whole point of the film and book, obviously, was that he was falsely convicted, as he had been falsely suspected for ten years, etc., etc., He's letting this one pass, writing it off to the sloppiness of a trade paper, but the ice is getting thinner, and I'm still a long way from shore. Clearly, McGinnis was misleading, if not outright lying, to MacDonald in early November 1981, as he had a year earlier when the San Francisco Examiner and Chronicle article appeared. And back on February 15, 1980, when McGinnis started his negotiations with Freddy Kassab, when did McGinnis become certain of MacDonald's guilt? There may be no specific date. Just a slippery slope of tergiversation, opportunism, and self-interest. But at some point, McGinnis's mind was made up. MacDonald was guilty. All that remained was the literary task of changing the narrative. In the letter that follows, it becomes clear that MacDonald has fewer and fewer people to confide in and less and less of a reason to confide in McGinnis. October 19th, 1982 I have no idea why I'm even writing you this note. I'm sure at this point you could care less for another letter from prison, but I can't write it to Mom and Brian. 
I want to concentrate on the case and not my prison conditions, so I'm saving his three sheets of paper for other type of discussions. I must be very dumb at times. I guess we all make mistakes, and I certainly do, but my judgment vis-a-vis -vis Bernie since trial, Sherry and Randy has seriously caused me to evaluate myself during these past three years. The book was moved from Delacorte to Putnam, and Phyllis Gran, Putnam's editor-in-chief, became McGinnis's editor. She sent notes. October 14, 1982 In going back and rewriting from the beginning, I think that your conviction that Jeff is guilty creeps into this version of the script too early in the story. In another letter to McGinnis, Gran writes, November 4, 1982 is Mildred Kassab trying to railroad Jeff? Should reader get that impression? Would you want to add some explanation for the change in testimony? Reader is certainly left with the impression that Mildred will lie to get Jeff convicted. Wouldn't it be better to close this chapter with some comment of your own? All of this does make the reader wonder if Jeff might be innocent. Would you want to add a few paragraphs of your own to lessen the impact? Please make sure that it is clear that Jeff is convicted because he is truly guilty and not just because he has a bad lawyer. You may wish from time to time to add a paragraph underscoring the fact that the judge is impressed with the evidence and not just disgusted with Bernie. You might even insert a sentence or two pointing out to the reader the irrefutable nature of certain pieces of evidence against Jeff. Did McGinnis alter his manuscript to make MacDonald look more guilty? It seems inarguable. So much so that his editor had to pull him back, like the good student who, in an effort to please the teacher, overdoes it. Make him a little less guilty at first to ratchet up the drama. Alter the story here and there for a more effective presentation. But it is Gran, McGinnis's editor, not him, who raises the issue of truth. All of this makes the reader wonder if Jeff might be innocent. Please make sure that it is clear that Jeff is convicted because he is truly guilty. Guilty in the story? Guilty in real life? McGinnis had an additional problem. He needed a new protagonist. If MacDonald was going to be the hero in the first version of the book, who would become the hero in subsequent versions? Peter Kearns, the crusading CID detective? Not likely. McGinnis calls Kearns a piggy Irish type in a letter to MacDonald. James Blackburn and Brian Murtaugh, the prosecutors? Maybe, but they appear too late in the story to be central characters. The simple choice was the in-laws, Mildred and Freddy Kassab. In particular, Freddy, the author of the competing book project. There is a sense that anything goes throughout McGinnis's correspondence and book, First, McGinnis ridicules the pajama top demonstration in the Boyd Norton letter to MacDonald, then praises the experiment in Fatal Vision. The crucial passage in Fatal Vision concerns the unnamed criminologist. There is a very convincing evidence, the paid expert said, referring to Stombaugh's pajama top reconstruction. Now I see why they got the indictment. Siegel attempted to be dismissive, discoursing at some length about how even the government's own theory of the crime offered no plausible explanation for why MacDonald would have placed his pajama top on his wife's chest before stabbing her with the ice pick. The criminologist simply shook his head. You can raise all that, Bernie, but this is like a fingerprint. Holy Christmas, that's very convincing stuff. Bernie, I'm not an attorney, but after seeing this, my advice to you and here he leaned forward and gave Siegel an avuncular pat on a pinstriped knee, is to get as much as you can into the record for appeal. This passage is damning, but to McGinnis, not MacDonald, it suggests a score of unnamed characters to be brought into the narrative, the unnamed expert waiting to be pulled out of the hat. In the Boyd Norton letter, the pajama top demonstration is hocus-pocus, in the book, it is very convincing evidence, and in the movie, difficult to explain, but damning nonetheless. On December 14, 1982, McGinnis delivered the manuscript of Fatal Vision to the publisher. McGinnis changed the title of his forthcoming book, No Longer Acid and Rain. It became Fatal Vision, 
a title based on Macbeth's dagger soliloquy, delivered just before the murder of Duncan, the king. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not, fatal vision, sensible, to feeling as to sight? The old title alluded to the discredited Stokely story, the new title to Macbeth's guilt-ridden conscience, his blood and gore-spattered hallucinations, as if Geoffrey MacDonald might share them. Eventually, distress creeps into MacDonald's writing. February 9, 1983 I need to see a copy of the book as soon as humanly possible. I can't for the life of me understand the arrogance and, in fact, hypocrisy in the stance that I'm like the general public in this case. It was one thing not to have control over the book, contents, you. I granted you that and have lived with it, except I asked you to treat Sherry well and Jay well for very different reasons. But to coyly play games, suggesting things to book reviewers and trade journals while I hear different versions is not right. Putnam's and you shouldn't deny me the right to read a copy of the book, if not today, certainly in March when your revisions are complete and a manuscript is definitely available. I would appreciate hearing back from you on this as soon as you can do it. I need to see the book. But McGinnis is adamant. MacDonald won't be given a copy of the book. February 16, 1983 at no time was there ever any understanding that you would be given an advanced look at the book six months prior to publication. As Joe Wambaugh told you in 1975, with him you would not even see a copy before it was published. Same with me. McGinnis had finished work. The publishers had secured coverage on 60 Minutes by Mike Wallace to run just after the book's release. On May 15, 1983, MacDonald wrote McGinnis. He was still in prison in Bastrop, Texas, but he had heard back about the first interviews the 60 Minutes crew had conducted with his friends and colleagues in Long Beach. May 15, 1983. The 60 Minutes crew and Mike W. were in LV Friday and Saturday, and it seemed to go exceptionally well. They really know the case well, and M.W. seemed to be able to discard chaff from wheat, or whatever the expression is. Everyone was unusually nervous, but it went well by all reports. They'll be here in two weeks. Chapter 51 A Book Story Histories are more full of examples of the fidelity of dogs than of friends. Alexander Pope June 1, 1983 When Mike Wallace showed up at the federal prison in Bastrop, Texas, MacDonald was expecting to be interviewed about the new evidence uncovered by his appellate attorneys. Elena Stokely had been interviewed by 60 Minutes two years earlier. It was all coming to some kind of conclusion, possibly a new trial. But MacDonald soon learned on camera, in his interview with Mike Wallace, that his worst fears were confirmed. He was being re-indicted and re-convicted in a book that would ultimately sell millions of copies on a news show that would be seen by tens of millions of people, and eventually in a TV miniseries that would be seen by over 60 million people. He also learned that he had been betrayed by Joe McGinnis. It didn't matter whether MacDonald was guilty or innocent, or whether he had been treated unfairly by the courts. Now everyone, virtually everyone, believed he was guilty. The Count of Monte Cristo never had such odds against him. Mike Wallace's opening comment set the stage. Why did Green Beret Captain Jeffrey MacDonald kill his wife and children? He says he didn't. It signaled that the show would be about MacDonald's motivation for the murders, not about his guilt or innocence. That was a given. Hand in hand with Joe McGinnis, Mike Wallace introduced America to a new theory of the murders. One of the problems with the 1979 trial had been the lack of a reasonable motivation. Hadn't the U.S. attorney written in his 1973 memo that the weakest aspect of the case was the absence of a motive? McGinnis had realized that his story had the same weakness. 
and so he supplied an explanation, a mechanism for how the murders happened. Diet pills. MacDonald was taking diet pills. Late in the program, Mike Wallace started in on the diet pills, as if MacDonald's claim of guilt or innocence should rest on the question, did he or didn't he take a lot of diet pills prior to the murder? The question might seem absurd, save for the weight placed on it by Wallace and McGinnis. Mike Wallace One has to say, look, why would he be taking off 12 to 15 pounds in a period of three to four weeks? Jeffrey MacDonald But if I did take off those 12 to 15 pounds over three to four weeks using three to four tablets of Escatrol, that's not abnormal. That's a normal thing. MacDonald first learned of McGinnis's conclusions when I talked with him in prison, and he was devastated. Why hasn't Joe McGinnis asked me, he says, about drugs, and listened to my answer? Joe McGinnis. Well, if there's one thing that the past 13 years have demonstrated conclusively and repeatedly, it is that Jeffrey McDonald's answers to pointed questions are not truthful. It would have said he was not taking the drug in any quantity. It would have said if he had taken one that night, it would not have had any effect on his behavior. It would have said that since he didn't commit the murders in the first place, any kind of speculation as to why he might have would be off-base and irrelevant. An odd and perverse argument. According to McGinnis, there was little or no reason to ask McDonald questions about the diet pills because McDonald's answers were not truthful. But it is easy to turn this around. McGinnis thought that McDonald's answers were untruthful because they were not what he wanted to hear. McGinnis saw no reason to ask McDonald questions about the diet pills because he had already decided that McDonald was guilty, and the diet pills were an essential part of his proof of McDonald's guilt. Think of 60 Minutes and the Fatal Vision miniseries that followed the publication of the book as another round in the battle between McDonald and his adversaries. Not only United States v. McDonald, but McDonald v. McGinnis, and Kassab v. McDonald, and anyone else who felt like piling on. Both Kassab v. McDonald and McDonald v. McGinnis became actual court cases. You can ask the same question of the television coverage and the 1979 trial. How can a reader, or a viewer, or a juror, know if pieces of the narrative are missing. Yes, McGinnis provided a narrative. The sociopathic MacDonald flew into an amphetamine-fueled rage and killed his family. But neither the 60 Minutes credits nor the on-air commentary mention that another interview had been conducted but never used. The interview with Helena Stokely, in which she confessed in front of a 60 Minutes producer and camera crew. At the very end of her interview, Stokely is asked by Joe Wershba, the 60 Minutes producer, whether she is willing to go back into court. Joe Wershba Do you realize, of course, that if you went into court, that the questioning would be a million times tougher than it was tonight? Helena Stokely I realize that. Yes, they will try to rip you to shreds, right? Do you think you could withstand that? I think that, well... The baby is due any day now. I think, once the pregnancy's over, I'm a pretty tough person. I'm not afraid of what they could ask me. I would have liked to interview Joe Wershba and Mike Wallace about the story, but Wershba died in 2011. Mike Wallace was infirm and couldn't be interviewed, and then he died in 2012. So I discussed the Stokely interview with Ted Landreth, a former CBS News producer who made a film in the late 1980s titled False Witness, which made a case for McDonald's innocence. I never talked to Joe Wershba, the 60 Minutes producer. Ted Landreth. It's such a shame you didn't because he died about four or five months ago. But it was he who taped the interview, which was supposed to be on 60 Minutes with Helena. The only existing interview, but it was never aired. Joe Wershba was one of the great heroes of the early days of CBS News. He worked with Murrow. He was Murrow's star reporter. He worked with Don Hewitt back in those days. See it now. And Joe and I knew each other from my CBS days. The point I'm making is that Joe wanted to do the story of Jeffrey McDonald and set about to do it for 60 minutes. And he discovered Gunderson and interviewed Helena Stokely and did a few other things, mainly the interview with Helena Stokely. 
And then Don Hewitt said to him, That's not the story. The story is McGinnis's book. Nobody even so much as looked at the interview they had with Stokely, much less did they use it. Mike Wallace, who did the piece, later on said to McDonald that it was a book story. He hated, hated doing book stories, because it wasn't journalism. It was just the book and McGinnis. And Wershba wrote a note to McDonald in which he said he thought Stokely should have been cross-examined under oath. He believed she was telling the truth. Imagine, 60 Minutes paid no attention to any of that, and the piece that they put on the air pretty much sealed McDonald's fate. It aired just about the time of the big appeal, and it made McGinnis's book a bestseller. CBS paid absolutely no attention to the journalism they might have done. They just paid attention to McGinnis. Mike Wallace unintentionally outlined the underlying problem. The 60 Minutes story had become disconnected from reality, from what really happened. All that was left was a story about a book that also might be disconnected from reality. The investigative element was gone, and in its place was a sorry kind of journalistic pugilism. McGinnis v. McDonald. Did you or didn't you use Escatrol? How much did you really use? How often? The assumption is that McDonald killed his family, and the only issue to be resolved is whether Escatrol was involved. It is like the question, when did you stop beating your wife? The question posed with an arched eyebrow, all possible answers are incriminating. As if the question of who did it could be answered simply by watching the convicted man fidget on television. On November 17, 1982, Joe Wershba wrote McDonald a letter. I am sorry for your troubles. Rumor had it wrong. I thought Miss Stokely made a competent witness and would have wanted to see her tested in court under cross-examination. I have a continuing interest in the case, and I regret that I cannot give you a firm word as to whether we will do anything on it on 60 Minutes. You are fortunate in your many friends who have never ceased to believe in you. Yours, Joseph Wershba. Bernie Siegel wrote to McDonald after watching the show. September 19, 1983. Re, 60 Minutes. I sat there holding my breath for the entire segment on the case. When it ended, I was wondering why I felt gaspy. Then I realized I was still holding my breath. I let out the air, started normal breathing, checked my pulse, and concluded that you and the case will survive. Joe McGinnis had a couple of desultory conversations with me during the trial, and then we had only one meeting after that. The latter meeting was the one at the Mark Hopkins Hotel. His only interest was how I came into the case. There was the meeting I was asking him where he stood in regard to you and his conclusion about the case. He categorically stated that he had no conclusion, contrary to his present assertions. If he had ever talked to me about whether I pursued the question of the Escatrol, he would have found his phony theory deflated. Chapter 52 Escatrol While he was still preparing his manuscript, McGinnis had asked MacDonald for access to his condo in Huntington Beach, where his files were stored, and MacDonald had given him the key. In Fatal Vision, McGinnis writes, On my last day at the condominium, I found more pages of notes in Jeffrey MacDonald's handwriting. The heading said, Activities, Monday, 16 February, 5.30 p.m., through Tuesday, in hospital, 17 February. McGinnis continues, this, too, was part of the detailed account which MacDonald had prepared at the request of his military attorney immediately after the April 6 announcement that he was being held as a suspect. This, he told War Heidi, was the most accurate, most complete, most coherent account of the murders which he had ever compiled. He had not, however, made it available to War Heidi or to the grand jurors. He had not made it available to any investigator. McGinnis sets the stage. This most accurate account had lain at the bottom of a cardboard box, covered by dozens of other files. With the warm Southern California sun of late November shining brightly through the sliding glass doors, I started to read. He makes it sound as though MacDonald was hiding something. According to McGinnis, MacDonald hadn't shown the notes to Victor Warheide, the prosecutor at the grand jury. But why should MacDonald share the notes written for his defense attorneys with those determined to put him behind bars? He did share them with his own investigators, lawyers, and McGinnis himself. 
It is deeply disingenuous. McGinnis knew about the diet pills during the trial, and had discussed them with Michael Malley and Bernie Siegel long before he discovered the document at the bottom of the cardboard box. Diet pills had been discussed and dismissed as early as the Article 32. In Malley's account from 1971, he wrote, Jeff worried that he might have taken an amphetamine the day of the crime. He was running a weight control program for the 6th Special Forces Group, and he himself was participating, including using diet pills. But one pill, even if he did take it, hardly could be worth worrying about too much. Here is the diary entry. It is reprinted at greater length in Fatal Vision, but this is the essence of it. We ate dinner together at 5.45 p.m., all four. It is possible I had one diet pill at this time. I do not remember, but it is possible. I had been running a weight control program for my unit, and I put my name at the top of the program to encourage participation. I had lost 12 to 15 pounds in the prior three to four weeks, in the process using three to five capsules of Escatrol Spansule, 15 milligrams dextroamphetamine, speed, and 7.5 milligrams prochlorperazine, copazine, to counteract the excitability of the speed. I was working out with the boxing team, and the coach told me to lose weight. In any case, the reason I could have taken the pill was twofold. One, to eat less in the evening when I snacked the most, and two, to try to stay awake after dinner since I was babysitting. It didn't work if I did take a pill, because I think I had a half-hour nap on the floor from 7.30 to 8 p.m. after I put Christy to bed. For McGinnis, it is the smoking gun. How did he transform an innocuous diary entry into something incredibly sinister? How did he transform two phrases, it is possible I had one diet pill at this time, and three to five capsules of Escatrol Spansule, into a raging amphetamine habit? How much he might be consuming will forever be, to employ a phrase used by Freddy Kassab before the grand jury, a dark area. But if the three to five were a daily dose, it would have been enough, taken over a period of three to four weeks, to have caused chronic amphetamine psychosis, many of the symptoms of which McDonald did, in fact, display. In the hospital after the murders, he also displayed symptoms associated with abrupt cessation of high dosages of the drug, such as, as cited in the physician's desk reference, extreme fatigue and mental depression. McGinnis is beguiled by the supposed explanatory power of his epiphany. Chronic amphetamine psychosis. I still don't get it. If McDonald, a highly trained emergency room physician, had overdosed on an amphetamine, wouldn't he be aware of that fact? And if so, would he direct attention to it by memorializing it in a diary, even if it was written for his lawyers? Is McGinnis suggesting a version of the coffee table? The telltale slip-up that gives the killer away? Was McDonald so cocky, so irrationally sure of himself, that he believed he could say or do anything? Or are these the actions of an innocent but imprudent man who believed he had nothing to fear from candor? Something more was needed. Diet pills plus something else. McGinnis suggested a two-part mechanism. If an amphetamine was the trigger, to continue the metaphor, what was triggered? For McGinnis, it had to be McDonald's underlying psychopathology. And it is here that Hervey Cleckley comes to the rescue. Take Cleckley's idea of the psychopath, who is indistinguishable from a normal person except that he is evil, and mix it up with some additional pop psychology, in this case, Christopher Lash's The Culture of Narcissism, Set up a simple equation, misogyny plus narcissism plus diet pills equals a triple homicide. The quote from Lash occurs in a chapter entitled, The Castrating Women of Male Fantasy. McGinnis writes, The narcissist's ideal concept of himself, Kernberg, a psychoanalyst who further developed the concept of the borderline personality disorder, writes, is a fantasy construction which protects him from such dreaded relationships with all other people, and also contains a helpless yearning and love for an ideal mother who would come to his rescue. Should such a dreaded relationship, such as marriage, materialize, 
The complex defense mechanism which has been constructed within the psyche of the pathological narcissist would come under severe stress, because, as Christopher Lash notes, such a person perceives the female, child or woman, wife or mother, as a monster who cuts men to ribbons or swallows them whole. Thus, in Lash's view, fear of the devouring mother of the pre-edible fantasy gives rise to a generalized fear of women, and this fear, closely associated with the fear of the consuming desires within, reveals itself as a boundless rage against the female sex. McGinnis builds to his ultimate conclusion. It is near the end of fatal vision, and even though it is a bluff, he plunks it down with ultimate bravura as if he is the proud owner of a royal flush. Might it be too much to surmise that since early childhood he has been suffering from the strain required to repress the boundless rage which psychological adjustment had caused him to feel toward child or woman, wife or mother, the female sex? And that on this night, this raw and somber military base February Monday night, Finally, with the amphetamines swelling the rage to flood tide, and with Colette, pregnant Colette, perhaps seeking to communicate to him some of her new insights into personality structure and behavioral patterns, Colette was taking a course in psychology, indeed possibly even attempting to explain him to himself, his defense mechanism for the first and last time proved insufficient. Would it be too much to suggest that in that one instant, the ensuing explosion of rage had destroyed not only Jeffrey MacDonald's wife and daughters, but all that he had sought to make of his life? Perhaps. McGinnis disappears into a sea of conjecture. Might it be too much to surmise? Would it be too much to suggest? In Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Robert Louis Stevenson imagined two characters, one good, one evil, bound together in what he called the agonized womb of consciousness. If each, I told myself, could be housed in separate identities, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable. The unjust might go his way, delivered from the aspirations and remorse of his more upright twin, and the just could walk steadfastly and securely on his upward path, doing the good things in which he found his pleasure, and no longer exposed to disgrace and penitence by the hands of this extraneous evil. It was the curse of mankind that these incongruous faggots were thus bound together, that in the agonized womb of consciousness these polar twins should be continuously struggling. What if these polar twins could be separated? And so, Dr. Jekyll drank off the potion and is transformed into the satanic Mr. Hyde before our eyes. Just substitute Escatrol for the large quantity of a particular salt, and you have uncovered the essence of McGinnis's argument. As in Stevenson, it just happens. I had long since prepared my tincture. I purchased at once from a firm of wholesale chemists a large quantity of a particular salt which I knew from my experiments to be the last ingredient required. And late one accursed night I compounded the elements, watched them boil and smoke together in the glass, and when the ebullition had subsided, with a strong glow of courage, drank off the potion. I knew myself, at the first breath of this new life, to be more wicked tenfold more wicked, sold a slave to my original evil. And the thought in that moment braced and delighted me like wine. Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is a work of fiction. People, real people, do not become tenfold more wicked. People suddenly and without warning are not transformed into monsters. I asked Rex Bieber about this. He was the UCLA lawyer-psychologist who interviewed Stokely in 1982 and has decades of experience both as a criminal defense attorney and as a forensic psychologist. When Joe McGinnis wrote his best-selling book, Fatal Vision, he claimed, actually contrary to most of the psychiatric opinion that had been offered, 
that MacDonald was psychopathic, and he argued that MacDonald was taking diet pills, Escatrol, and that the combination of the two were the cause of the murders. Rex Bieber That's a non-explanation. First of all, stimulants on their own don't cause homicidal impulses. I'm not saying that people on stimulants haven't committed homicides, but there's always an adequate explanation of the homicide without the stimulant. All the stimulant added was the loss of impulse control to allow you to act on an impulse that was already there. That's number one. Secondly, the diagnosis of psychopathy is a diagnosis that you always have to be very careful of, because it often begs the question. By that I mean, if you say to the person who gives a diagnosis, if you knew to a certainty that he did not commit the crime, would you give him the diagnosis of psychopath? And almost always in these kinds of cases, the answer is no. I mean, a psychopath has a very specific kind of history. Engaging in illegal conduct, poor performance in school, conduct disorders as a child, disrespect for authority, failure to learn from experience, frequent long-term affairs, drug and substance abuse. McDonald doesn't have any of these characteristics, to my knowledge. This is a guy who was an ideal student, who was a physician, who not only acquiesced to authority, but lived within a universe where respect for authority and obedience is absolutely required. The diagnosis of psychopathy under these circumstances is simply made retroactively, because one believes that the person committed the crime, and you can't do that. That's not logically appropriate to assume the conclusion, to prove the conclusion. You have to be able to prove the diagnosis independently from the allegations. Otherwise, it all becomes a sham and a game. A sham and a game? Yes. By the way, abuse of stimulant medication among physicians, especially physicians who do emergency work, which he did, as I remember, is extremely common. When I taught in the residency program at UCLA, I don't think I knew anybody in an internship that didn't use dexedrine or methamphetamine to stay awake during the long shifts. Nothing about that explains a homicide. Did he take those drugs? Yes, he said he may have taken one on the day of the murders. Stimulants don't cause homicide, period. It's a non sequitur. No more than heroin causes burglaries. Do heroin addicts often burglarize houses? Yes, but that's because heroin costs a lot of money, and the only way to buy it for some people is to commit burglaries. That he took some amount of stimulants doesn't explain anything. The issue of McDonald's possible amphetamine usage and the diary he had prepared for Bernie Siegel had come up in Michael Malley's journal. I spoke to him again. Yes, that was an issue that came up and went away. It was an issue that the defense clearly thought about and talked about a lot, that Jeff brought up himself. He said he was running a weight loss program for, what was it, the 6th Special Forces Group, and that included amphetamines because, at the time, that was the weight loss drug. And he had taken some, too. I'm not even sure the government ever brought this up, but I certainly remember the defense brought it up with Jeff and his friends, his escort officers, and the other people in the Special Forces group. You know, have you ever seen Jeff out of control for any reason after he's taken these kinds of drugs? And the answer was always no. We kind of put it that way. And the docs in the hospital at Womack, they all said he was agitated when he was brought in, but he didn't exhibit any signs of drug abuse or anything else. So it just kind of went away before it ever became an issue. Now McGinnis... I have no idea where he came up with all that stuff, but he did. He came up with it because Jeffrey allowed him into his condo in Huntington Beach. That's exactly right. I have to say, we all trusted McGinnis. I didn't distrust him, but I never felt good about it. My view was, you really don't want outsiders being inside the defense offices. But Bernie wanted him there, and Jeff wanted him there. He was making some money out of the thing, and to be honest about it, I never thought of Joe as an enemy. I never thought of him as a friend, either. He was just there. And when I finally read the book, I was kind of astounded, to be honest. But it was way too late by then. Yes. Now, I don't think that book started out as an attack on MacDonald. I think it started off as a defense of MacDonald. That's true. Here's what I know. I know that up until the day of the verdict, Joe was always around. I liked him being around, particularly because he and Jeff would go out running around the North Carolina State running track, and they played pool. They were best buddies, and I had stuff to do. I was trying to round up witnesses. I was trying to keep people showing up on time. 
and I had to take a leave of absence from my own law firm, and I had a couple of big cases going on. So every once in a while, I'd have to take a couple of days and fly to San Francisco for something or other. Joe filled the role of Jeff's best friend, so I didn't have to fill the role of Jeff's best friend. And that was good. I mean, I liked that. And Joe was, he's very likable. He always has kind of a hangdog look, and you always are wondering whether somebody kicked Joe yesterday, and he's unhappy, and you always kind of pet him a little bit to make him feel better. And that's how he works, and I'm sure that's how he really is. But I never got the feeling, you know, we were living in that stupid fraternity house, which that really did drive me nuts, but that was Bernie's idea too. It was cheap, and we all got to live together, and Joe was always kind of hanging around and talking and stuff. So I never, never, never got the feeling that Joe was hostile. But the day the verdict came back, we had to move out of the fraternity house because school was starting, and we were in a motel of some kind, and I remember, I think my room was next to Joe's, right next door to Joe. And so when they led Jeff out in handcuffs, and we went back to the hotel, and I remember we were standing on the balcony, looking over a parking lot, a very scenic parking lot, and Joe was there, and I was kind of, he said, what do you think? And I said, it's just awful. I said, it can't be. I said, you know, an injustice has been done, or something like that. I said, you know, whether you think he's innocent or not, they simply did not prove he's guilty. So he is not guilty, and the jury just got it all wrong. And I started to light into Judge Dupree about that. And I looked at Joe, and he said, well, this changes everything. And I said, what does it change? And he said, everything. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, everything. And that's as far as he would go.